Thank you, Janice. What's your greatest hope right now? Like, what if it came true would, like, radically undo your life in a good way? What are you just, like, waiting for from the Lord? Keep that in mind. I um, want to start off by doing some word work, if you will, some definition of the word hope. Uh, it's interesting, as I looked at both sort of like Webster's definition and then a biblical de definition of hope, they're very much the same. There's two words. If you have your outline and you're you sort of a, like a fill-in-the-blanks type person, you'll see two blanks there. If not, and you're just taking notes or you're like, can remember all of it? Here, here are the two words that my prayer would be resonate in your heart this week. Confident expectation. Confident expectation expectation. What is hope? It's more than wishful thinking. It's more than um, sort of like this removed, uh, fingers crossed, just kind of waiting out our days. No, no, no. Real hope, even in, in a worldly sense, and then much more so in a biblical sense, is confident expectation. Like, I know it's going to happen. I just don't know when. Now, I know it's going to happen. I just don't know when. I know this dude's going to finish his sermon. We just don't. Okay. Listen, we got a lot to cover today, and I'm super excited to be talking about hope because you can, I was <laughs> reading some stuff about hope. You can live without food a certain amount of days. You can live without water a certain amount of days, shelter a certain amount of days, but you can't go very long without hope, no matter who you are and what your station in life is is. Um, if you're a movie guy, girl, you'll, you'll be familiar with this sort of like epic movie that came out uh, a, a while back, Shawshank Redemption. You Shawshank Redemption fans? Okay, you know, you hear that? All right, cool, cool. You like movies about people in jail? That's all right. We're not going to judge you one bit. There's a line in that movie that to me is by far like my favorite line in the whole movie, and it's spoken by this guy named Red. And he's, and he's dialoguing about a couple of things, and um, he speaks it to Andy. And, and Andy is starting to talk about hope. Andy is starting to talk about, like, hey, maybe things on the other side or whatever. He's, he's kind of he's has this context for maybe life's not always going to be like this or whatever. Man, he's, he's starting to think outside the box. And this is what Red says to him. Hope is a dangerous thing. That is so true for the follower of Jesus. Hope in Christ is a dangerous thing. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, fast forward to you know, a movie that I've been talking about here for the last couple of weeks, Creed II, and, and, and here's a situation. It takes you into the ring, and there's this battle. I'm not going to tell you what happens, of course. I'm not going to be that guy. But there's a moment when Rocky has to speak a word to young Creed because he's on the brink of maybe uh, giving up, or you don't know what's going to happen. He's, he's kind of down and out, and it's in the midst of the battle. And this is what Rocky tells Creed. You're a dangerous man. Like, don't forget, go show him, you're a dangerous man. You know, I think the Father wants you to hear this morning, if you're in Christ, you're a dangerous man. You're a dangerous woman. There's an enemy in a world out there who does not want you to flourish and thrive and attempt great things for Jesus. But don't you dare forget that there is a hope within you that makes you dangerous. William Carey, 18th century, came along, and he was a, uh, he was a, a young Baptist student, if you will, just recently ordained, and um, the, the feedback that he got from his idea was, quote, sit down, young man, you're an enthusiast. Sit down, young man, you're an enthusiast. Here, here was his idea. What if we took the gospel of Jesus Christ out of England and started sharing it with the nations? You know, like, like it kind of says in the, in the Bible to do. Sit down, young man. You're an enthusiast. 
William Carey went on to become the father of what we know as like modern mission movement. And he's credited as kind of like breaking the ceiling, if you will, and helping people to see that it's not just what's happening here in Delray Beach, it's what's happening in Haiti. It's what's happening all throughout the world, and we want to join God in that. But in order to join God in that, we would have to understand this next idea from William Carey. And here's how it rolls out. Expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Because what you're expecting from God will have a large determination on what you're attempting for God. If you look around your life and it's just kind of like, man, it's the same old, same old, and you're just kind of like grinding through and you don't see a lot of fruit, you don't, it's, it's like um, you, haven't, you don't remember the last time you kind of took a step in faith and like, yeah, I'm going to try that and it's a little bit risky, but I think like Jesus' name will be lifted high and so I'm, we'll just kind of figure it out as we go along. If you don't remember the last time you did like one of those steps of faith, then it might be the case that you're not expecting very much from God. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Well, what gives us that type of attitude? What would give us that type of uh, posture, if you will? Man, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go right to Romans 8. We've got a lot to cover today. And we're going to get into what would drive a person to become that kind of dangerous, where they would expect great things from God. So much so that they start attempting great things for God. Now, Romans 8, you have to understand, this is, I'm going to drop some like huge biblical knowledge on you right now. Romans 8 comes right after Romans 7. Okay? Now, you, that might need to sit with you for a minute. If you know anything about scripture, Romans 7 is, um, if you're pursuing Christ, but you're really aware of how messy it is, like your pursuit, Romans 7 describes you. It's like, it's like your chapter. Because here's what Paul's saying. The things I want to do, I end up not doing. And the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. I'm a, like, I'm a wreck. Who can save me? Oh, wait. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Thanks be to God for the gift of Jesus. So Romans 8 is really important that you understand that it comes after Romans 7 because Romans 7 sets up like the condition that you and I still exist in in the flesh. For the believer who puts their faith in the finished work of Jesus, for the person who comes to Jesus and is like, man, I, I'm, I'm hearing that you died for my sin. I'm hearing that I can be forgiven only through faith in you. I'm hearing that I, I, if I'll just simply turn from my own efforts and my own sort of like pursuit of me, and I'll just say yes to you, Jesus, receiving what you've done on my behalf and following you. If I come to you in that type of faith, that God accepts me and forgives me and gives me new power and new identity, for the person who's made that decision, Romans 7 is still true of you. Like, just because you've been perfected in the eyes of the Father through Christ doesn't mean you actually experience that fully here and now. And I love the, the fact that the Apostle Paul is very real with his struggles because you know what it means? It means, I guess, in the gospel that Jesus is so beautiful, I don't always have to be. So I can just lay it out there for you. How you doing? Not well. That's okay in the gospel. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. That's okay in the gospel too. Both get to survive. And so Romans 7 kind of gets us ready for, hey, like this is the reality of what life, this is a struggle, and it doesn't always look pretty. But then it goes to Romans 8. Just when you thought you might lose hope, just when you thought your Christian life might be just like this, ah, uh, like it's never going to get any better, I'm never going to see any forward movement, where's the hope? Man, God drops in Romans 8, and he gives us this amazing picture of hope. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Romans 8, and we're going to be really working our way through the whole chapter. 
But we're going to do a deep dive on one particular verse. And so here's what I want to do. Uh, in Romans 8, as it pertains to hope, as it pertains to um, this, this living hope that might make somebody like you or me who's actually a Roman 7 person become dangerous, we have to, we have to look at a few, uh, some of which are like legal reasons for us to have hope, and then one reason that I think is absolutely captivating. Now, now really, they're all captivating, but, but it seems as though these are kind of like potentially building on each other. And so if we'll go, go back one slide, please. These are, these are some of the reasons for us um, to have hope. Ready? Uh, and and there's, there's a couple of here. First of all, in Romans 8, there's no condemnation. If you are in Christ, if you have come to that place of receiving Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and you've, tr you've surrendered your life to him, you're following him, then you can have incredible, not just rest, but hope that there's no condemnation for you. Check this out. There's nobody coming who knows what you did last year that can bring a charge against you that can actually stick. Now, you might have to go and serve some time for what you did because there's legal ramifications, but there are no, there's no eternal condemnation that will ever catch up to you that Christ doesn't already know about and has already paid and overcome. I mean, that's, that gives you great hope. Because it allows for you to be fully present in this moment, knowing, man, there's no more condemnation on me. Number two, righteous requirements of Christ in verse four have been fulfilled. Man, they've, they've been fulfilled. And so what that means is there was a law, and, and basically this is the way that God set it up, because God is both judge and defender. Most people don't play that. If you were to go to a court of law, most of the time there's a, there's a man or woman who's judge, and there's one who's defender. God plays both roles. He's judging. He's like, here's the, here's the righteous requirements of the law. You are expected to fulfill them all because I'm holy and just. And when you don't, there will be penalty because of your, because of your, your negligence, your sin, your, your cosmic treason against my law. That's the way God operates. The, the, the penalty for that is, is death. It's, it's separation physically, spiritually, and eternally. But because God is also defender, he has come and he, in the form of Jesus, and he's gone to a cross, and he's taken your sin and mine, he's, he's taken our place, and, and not only has he died for our sin, but before he went to the cross, he actually lived this life of perfectly fulfilling the law. He always made the right choice, he always had the right thought, he always had the right word. So he fulfilled the law in a way that you and I never could, and when he rose from the dead, for those of you who would receive him as Savior and Lord, he then credited you his life. It was as though you lived the life of Jesus, like you fulfilled the law like Jesus did. So when you don't, and when you fail, and when you go back to Romans 7, you can be reminded, wait a minute, wait a minute, I know this is what I'm experiencing right now, but I know there's a truth greater than my experience that tells me I'm actually righteous because of Jesus. Number three, Christ in you. There's great hope because legally, not only are you forgiven, legally, not only has the righteousness of Christ been given to you, but Christ actually lives inside of you. Like for those of you who are in Christ, he has come to dwell in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. And what that means is not only have all the requirements been met, but now you have the person living within you who met those requirements and who is more and more and more meeting them through your actual experience. The person of the Holy Spirit is how Christ does that. And as he's come to live within you, he's making you more and more like his character. That's great hope because that means that even though your flesh wants to fail, even though your flesh enjoys failure to a degree, you have a new spirit within you that pulls you away from that and actually moves you forward in your Christian life. And then finally, you have the spirit of adoption. And here's what that means. That legally, you were once a spiritual orphan. Where, where God the Father, he couldn't be your father because you were, you were separated from him because of your sin. But he came to where you were. He stepped into your uh, foster care, if you will, spiritually. And he said, you're going to be mine forever through Jesus. Come with me. And he legally gave you a new name. 
He legally said, you follow me, you come with me, you now are mine. And that was a legal transaction in his court of law where he was both judge and defender. And I love all of those items. They're all beautiful to think of and motivate the hope that you have because sometimes we go back to a Roman 7 lifestyle or even like that, that we start thinking about like how we messed it up or how we did And we're given these truths to meditate on that will actually help increase our hope. But there's one here in this Advent season that I wanted to focus on more than the other. And it's found here in, the, in our next slide. In verse um, uh, 18, Romans 8:18. 8, here's what it says. One coming reason for hope, sort of the title of it. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth compl- comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Here's what Paul is not saying. He's not saying that your suffering doesn't matter. He's not saying that it doesn't hurt. He's not saying that the abuse, the divorce, the cancer, the very real life things that you walk through, he's not saying they don't matter or they don't actually cripple and destroy pieces of your heart. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying, rather, is they're just not worth comparing to what's to come. There is a glory that is to be revealed both to us and in us that far eclipses our present day suffering. What, one of the things I love about Christianity is it never, uh, it never ignores the fact that suffering is real. It always actually embraces a theology of suffering, like you are allowed to and expected to suffer as a follower of Jesus. We wouldn't be made like Jesus, who suffered more than anyone, if suffering were not a part of our reality. So this Advent season is not to pretend like you're not suffering, is not to pretend like it doesn't hurt and potentially force you to walk with a limp the rest of this particular life. The Advent hope is that it's just not worth comparing to what's coming. So we want to do a little bit of a study here on what is actually coming. What is the glory that is to be um, revealed to us? And so I did a little research here. In in other uh, parts of the passage, you'll be able to see that it talks about it as a, a redemption of our bodies, adoptions as sons, um, I, w- I did a little uh, work on bluelightbible.com. Highly recommend that place for you if you want to uh, get some more insight on, on a particular passage. And a guy by the name of Don Stewart has a, uh, a section on there that's all about what is it, uh, give us some in- information on our resurrection body. Like what's our resurrection body going to be like? Because that's, that's a part, a big part of the glory to be revealed to us. Now the centerpiece is that we get to be with Jesus face to face forever. But but we wouldn't be able to enjoy that and experience that if it weren't for what I'm about to explain to you, this resurrection body. And so I want to break down a couple of like really important things as it pertains to the resurrection body that you and I receive for those of us who are in Christ. What is this glory that is to be revealed to us? Well, first of all, we're linked to Christ. We're linked to Christ. So the scripture, and this is all biblically based, the scripture tells us that our bodies are going to be like his body. And so I'm going to just leave that one there and, and unpack a few of the things because as I unpack a few of the things, you're going to see some of the, some of the things that Jesus' body could do. Um, number two is we're going to have an actual literal body. We are not going to be disenmem- disenmembered, sort of like floating spirits, you know, almost like the, the Disney World, you, you know, haunted house mansion where things are flying around. We're just kind of like floating around. No, we're going to have an actual body. It's going, it's going to be like flesh and blood. It's going to be similar to the body that you have right now, but there's gonna be some significant differences to it. Number three, it's gonna have new capacities. This body, this glory that is to be revealed in us and to us, it's gonna have new capacities. Um, For instance, one of the things that we saw that Jesus could do in his resurrection body was he could immediately disappear. Now, I know some of you would like love that quality right now. (laughs) You'd be like, boom, I want that quality right now. I can't believe I just said that. I would love to just jet out of here. But he was talking to some people, and then he was gone. Um, There's going to be a a capacity where um, 
the, the locked doors and walls and, and sort of barriers, they can't hold this body anymore because the disciples were all in the upper room and, and the doors were locked and all of a sudden Jesus appeared. So there's going to be a, an, an appearing capability. There's going to be a disappearing capability. We know that Jesus ate with his disciples. We know that he enjoyed food and, and, and conversation and he talked and there was touch. It's just that all of these things, these senses that I'm explaining to you, they're going to have far greater capability than what we know right now. And all of their capability, did you know that every sense you've been given right now has been to lead you to a greater experience of Jesus? Whether you eat or whether you drink, do it all to the glory of God. Whether you play volleyball, whether you run, whether you're on this team, whether you light the Advent candle, whether you go home and take care of young children, do it all to the glory of God. Everything that you do, everything that you have to do it is meant to give you a greater experience of your greater treasure, Jesus. So in the new body, we're going to be able to experience many of the same things, but without the boundary of the flesh that we now have, and it's going to be like overjoyed moment after overjoyed moment. Because we have new capacities. We're going to have a transformed body, which means that it's going to be similar to this body, but it's going to be changed in some of those capacities that I talked about. What do I mean? First of all, it's going to be God-given. This is going to be a God-given body. Divinely inspired. It's going to be powerful. I loved this one. As I was working through his list of things, I loved it. But powerful. Do you ever feel weak to do the things of God? Sometimes I feel the weakest when I'm trying to like, attempt those great things. If, you're never, if you never feel weak, there could be a potential that you're never actually attempting anything great. And you get to like, live in this comfort zone, in which our enemy would love. So don't think of weakness as a bad thing. Think of it at least at times, if you, look, if you check your surroundings, as maybe I'm, I'm actually taking a step for greatness towards Jesus, and I'm feeling the weakness of my body. Well, check this out. There's a great hope for people like you and for people like me because we are going to one day have a powerful body where that weakness will no longer be evident and existent. We're going to be angel-like. We're not going to become angels. We're not going to float around. But the scripture says that we're going to be like angels not giving and receiving in marriage. And what that means is our relationships now are going to be different. We're going to have a unity and a connectedness. The highest level of connectedness oftentimes can be, um, be, be between, within a marriage, within a covenant of a marriage. And the scriptures are really clear. Like, um, we're going to have that covenant relationship all the time. It's not just going to be for those who have a thriving, flourishing marriage. And even if you're in a great marriage, it's going to be way better than that. This new body and our new experience, um, it's going to be a spiritual body. And what that means is right now, one of the main defining um, components of our body is the flesh. We talk about the flesh. We talk about our sin. We, we have accountability groups. Yo, there's not going to be any more need for accountability groups. You are not going to be accountable for anything besides, there's just going to be like praise and worship groups. Oh my goodness, did you see this about Jesus? No, I was over here in the city and I was like helping this person. But oh my, did you see that? Did you know this about, I didn't know, tell me more. We might, we'll probably have groups, but they're just gonna be like, um, like these amazing groups that talk about the glory of Jesus all the time. Nobody's gonna go to that group saying, oh, I wonder if I need to share this or not. You're gonna be like, I can't wait to share this. It's gonna be a spiritual body as well as a physical body. It's going to be immortal and incorruptible. Those of you who suffer from chronic pain right now, today is not your day. Today is not your day to think that somehow, some way, this body is my great hope. God can heal you, and God may, and to God be the glory if he does. But one day we are going to have a body that is incorruptible, that will not age, it will not be damaged, it will not grow old, it will simply flourish in the things of Jesus. We're going to have an adaptability to our new environment because when Jesus comes back, which he promises to do, he's going to renew all things and we're going to have a body that is adaptable to those new environments. It's going to be a glorious body. 
Now, this idea of, of glory would be, um, the, the, the next adjective there is luminous. Yes, there, there's probably going to be something that's light, potentially, about this body, but it's going to be a glorious body like Jesus' resurrected body. There's going to be something different about it. You know, some of you think that you know when somebody's pregnant because they are not because not they're overweight, not, not because you're going to say anything inappropriate, because they're glowing. You would say, you're glowing. It looks like you might be pregnant. We're all going to, like, I guess, look pregnant in that way. <laughs> you're pregnant. I, you're pregnant. I know. It's like this new body. It's awesome. We're going to, the, the, the scripture talks about, like, this Shekinah glory of God that Moses had an encounter with, and when he came down, he, like, had to hide his face because it was like, dude, what happened to you? You're freaking us out. It's like you were with the Lord, and he brought that glory back, and it eventually faded away. There's one day when that glory will never fade away in us. And it's going to point all of us back to Jesus over and over and over again. Where'd that glory come from? You know, dog, why are you playing? Jesus. We're going to love this moment. It's also going to be a unique body. You're going to be you. We're not going to be morphed into somebody to be like, where'd Karen go? Oh, no, that's Karen. Look at her new body. That's Catherine. Look, look at Dwayne Sears' new body, man. Look at it. This guy's a We're, You're going to be you. You're going to be unique. But you're going to be transformed. Man, I just have to tell you, like, this week, this was such good news to me. Um, it was like God was taking me on the curriculum of life. Because um, if, if you kind of understand anything about a mind that is somewhat restless, you know that it's either potentially anxious about someone or something, or if there's peace out here, it just, like, starts eating itself a little bit. Can you relate to that? It's like, why do you feel this? I don't know. Everything's great, actually. The Lord's giving me victory here, here, here. I just like, it just, just like a broken record. It comes, comes around, and I don't know. And here's what the Lord told me. He's like, you know that mind of yours that feels like it's eating itself right now? You've got some cool victory. Like, like I've, I've shown you don't need to people, please. I've shown you this. I've shown you can rest in my glory. And yet it's still kind of like self-sabotaging. Here's what I want to tell you about that mind right now. I want you to allow this moment to remind you of what's to come when you get your new mind. Because you're not just going to get a new body. You're going to get a new mind. In my mind, I want to tell you a little bit about my mind. Those relentless thoughts that seem to be non-stopping and super distracting are actually going to be renewed to such a degree that they're going to be relentless about Jesus, the one I really want to focus on. And so it can be broken. It can eat away because now, because of this Advent hope, I just use it as a moment to remind me of the mind that's to come, not the one I wish I had today. So, thinking through this idea of hope and, and resurrection, what would be the requirements to this hope? What would you need to have in order to experience this hope? A couple of fill in the blanks here for you in, in your outline. Make sure you get them. The first one, if you want to be able to experience this type of hope, you, there's two things. You have to be hopeless and willing. Crazy thing about the hope of Jesus is you can't get it until you're hopeless. You still, got a lot of, you still got a little hope? Uh-uh, can't have it yet. You're not done hoping in yourself or others or religion or something else? Sorry, dude. Got to wait till you hit the bottom. Hopeless and willing. It sounds a lot like my friends who walk through steps one and two and three of the Alcoholics Anonymous program. You can't get it till you really need it. I think one of the biggest struggles that we have with hope in Christ, this type of hope that actually makes us dangerous, is we've got too much hope in other things. And until, like Keller says, Christ is all you have, then you're not going to realize that Christ is all you actually need. That's the type of hope that starts to make us dangerous. That's the first requirement, is that you must become hopeless and willing. I, I can't measure up, God. I don't have what, it need. I, don't have what I need. I, can, I, can't, like, um, I can't fulfill these longings. 
that I keep looking to other people and places to fulfill. I'm hopeless without you, Jesus. Will you come and give me this life that you've promised to give me? When you come to him hopeless and willing that way, then he actually gives you this type of hope. But there's a second part to it today. It's not just the requirements to the hope, but how might you begin to experience this hope a little bit more? You would need an informed imagination. You would need an informed imagination, not just an imagination, but one that had the correct information, which is why I took the time to walk you through those specific things that our new body is going to have and and get to do. And so I would encourage you this particular Advent season to go ahead and imagine a little bit. I feel like we have great imaginations sexually. I feel like we have great imaginations financially. I feel like we have great imaginations when it comes to our career. But man, when is the last time you spent a little bit of time just thinking about what is it going to be in that day? Because I'm telling you one day, it's not going to be the same. One day, not too far away. You are not going to be in your current reality and it is going to be a state of radical blessedness with you and God's people and Jesus. Why don't you spend some time imagining now that you have the information what that experience is gonna be like. I'll tell you what, it might make your current sufferings grow dim. How do you think I was able to tell you about my mind? because I stopped and imagined what it's gonna be like in that day rather than saying, fix me now, Jesus, I hate this. Oh wait, maybe you're trying to use this to lift my eyes and think about what's coming in that day. I'll take that. I'll take that all day. I've got a good friend of mine here and says, man, we gotta preach on heaven. We got to preach on the second coming. It's like one of the greatest things in the gospel that we don't share. So let's go ahead and use our informed imagination to lean into our confident, expected future. The last thing is, man, if you really want to become dangerous. Now, I'm not, look, I'm not playing games anymore. Like, if you really want to go all in and become dangerous in this type of hope and start to see it transform you, I mean, this is, this is, that's actually the hope I have for my kids. As I raise my kids, I am not hoping that they're going to be good listeners, sit in your seat, follow the rules type of like, just follow the, the, the common culture of what's happening. I am trying my best to raise dangerous kids. I want them to absolutely break down walls, to take strongholds by the throat in the name of Jesus and say, no longer on my time. Daddy, I, you know what? You planted a church and you did some really cool things because of the way that you got dangerous with, with your hope. Man, that's nothing. Here's where I'm going. So every night, When I tuck them in, I ask them a few questions. Because my thought, my theory is that the more they understand me as a father, the more they'll understand their real heavenly father. That's true on both good and bad sides, right? So here's what happens on a usually nightly basis. I ask them these few questions. Sometimes I do it when I'm laying down with them. They both recently asked me to come on. Hey, Dad, come on, lay, lay down with me. I used to do it more when I was, when they were younger, because we all, like, they all had, like, a normal bedtime. Now they're, like, going to bed here and there, and I'm going to bed early. Like, I'm old, and they're, they're not. So I don't always get to lay with them like I, like I used to. But recently, uh, they actually both were like, come on. You know how cool it is when you're a 13-year-old and you're 16-year-old, like, come and lay with me, Daddy? And by the way, they would never call me Daddy out here. They'd call me Dad. But behind the scenes, that's Daddy. <laughs> always. And here's the questions I asked them. It's just real simple. Who's daddy's girl? Who's daddy's boy? And for how long? I am. Forever. And then I give them a word of encouragement. Because I have to have them know who they are 
and for how long they get to keep that identity. You wanna get dangerous with your hope in Christ? And you gotta know who you are and for how long. Romans 8 this week beckons you to answer these questions. Check this out as we get ready to head into communion moment. These are the questions, if we can go to that next slide. These are the questions that require daily answers this week. As the Father just sort of gets close to you. As the Father, I was thinking, man, you know, somebody told me that there's a day when my daughter's actually going to leave and go to college. Somebody told me it's, it's going to happen and it's going to be really hard. And so every now and then I, I start thinking, man, that's a weird, painful reality that I'm kind of looking forward to and kind of not. What am I going to do when she's not there to lay with and ask these questions? Well, maybe I'll take a book out of my Heavenly Father's picture and write them down like he did. Here are the questions that he asks us to answer at the end of chapter 8. What can we say about all these things of hope? Like there's a response that you are expected to make when we start talking about the hope of Christ. Who can be against us, he asks. Who's going to be against us? Who's it going to be? Let me know their name because they're going down. How will he not graciously give us all things? You don't think you have enough right now in the moment to experience the gladness of this hope? You do. You have everything you need at all times in Christ. Who shall bring any charge against us? Not not your neighbor, not your friend, not your ex-girlfriend, not yourself for, for the same mistake that you made. Even your inner lawyer who hates your righteousness can't bring a charge against you. Here's what your daddy wants you to know. Who is there to condemn you? There's nobody there to condemn. I'm accepting you in Christ right where you are. Who shall separate us? You're doing well? Awesome. You're not doing well? Who's going to separate us? Who would break us up? I hold this relationship. You receive and enjoy it. Shall tribulation or distress or your current hardship? No, no, no. Rather, in all these things, you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You want to get dangerous? Start understanding that you're more than a conqueror. You're not a survivor. You're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And as we come to the table now, we are going to experience the word of our Father gently nourishing our souls as we take the cup and as we take the bread, reminding us of what has happened in our place and pointing us forward to the day when he comes back and fulfills all things. If you're one of those people who are going to serve communion uh, for us today, would you please come to your, your spots? We'll have a few people up here and we'll have a few people in the back. And if you're sitting towards the front end, we're going to ask that you come forward. And if you're uh, sitting toward the back, we're going to ask that you turn and, and, and go back there. And you'll take a, a piece of bread and you'll take a cup. And Communion is a celebration of the body and blood of Jesus Christ crucified for you so that you might be free in him, so that you might become as dangerous as he is. I want to be clear to you that dangerous things are not just for sort of the staff and church leadership because you know the word great is defined as servant. You want to be dangerous? Go home and start by just changing your tone of voice by the way you talk to your kids. You want to be great? Encourage your husband all week whether he deserves it or not. You want to be great? Think ahead of your wife of what would allow her to flourish. Do it quietly with great joy in your heart. Let's be great in our homes before we're great anywhere else. We have the power and the source, Christ in us, that does that. And so we're going to invite you to come forward here in just a moment. I'm going to pray over the elements, and communion is open to any Christ follower. If you, put your, if you become hopeless and willing towards Jesus, this is, this is your moment. If you find yourself at peace with a particular sin or area of your heart where God's trying to soften it and you're like, no, I don't want to go that way, then we would just say that that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It just means that you should probably allow this moment to pass and ask God's spirit to soften your heart in that area and then next time come and celebrate what God has done in that moment. That's not my opinion. That's the opinion of the New Testament. That's how Paul sets up communion, that we would examine ourselves in a worthy manner and then we would come hopeless and willing. 
Father, we ask that you would indeed fill us with your spirit and nourish us spiritually as we come and receive your elements as your people in Christ's name. Amen. On the night that most powerful name was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He says, take and do this in remembrance of me. On the same night, he took the cup and he said, this blood is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. The New Testament picks up on that truth and says, when, when, we, when we take, it allows us to look back and look forward to when he's coming again. So drink with that in mind. I attended Praise and Worship City Church this morning. Fantastic spirit of God upon them. Great praise and worship. And there was a great word the pastor Brooks spoke. And here's, here's what he said. We've got an enemy that would love to steer, steal your identity. I would say we've got an enemy that would love to steal your identity, that would love to confuse you about those seven questions that are essential to your identity, that are essential to your hope. But if you want to grow dangerous toward that enemy who would love nothing more for you to remain apathetic and fearful, then please spend some time each morning specifically answering those questions I just went through. They're at the end of Romans chapter 8. And ask God to remind you of that confident expectation, of that hope that we know is coming. We just don't know when. Amen? Let's stand and, and be uh, dismissed. I'm going to invite our prayer partners to come forward, and um, they're going to be here. If, if you came in here and you, you're a bit hopeless, Maybe you're hope deficient, as we talked a little bit about encouragement deficient last week. We ask, we ask the Lord to bring, to bring the hopeless in. We ask the Lord to bring those who, um, you know, we're, we're kind of like downcast in spirit. So if that's you, we prayed specifically for you to come and to receive some of this resurrection hope that belongs specifically to the followers of Jesus. And sometimes to activate that hope, it's not just a mental exercise. You actually need somebody to lay a hand on you and pray that hope into you. God activates things through prayer. So if that's you, you've heard some cool stuff, maybe the Spirit of God spoke to you, well, I'm just going to invite you to come and receive hope. Even if you've got that Shekinah glory going on and you are hopeful right now, come and get some more. The doors are open for the hope of God because the more hope you get, the more dangerous you become. I encourage you to receive the benediction now. May the God of all peace and understanding and hope fill you with what he's given you today and what is to come. Amen and amen. Love you guys. See you next week.